everyone, brothers and sisters, comrades, everybody, welcome to the Midwestern Marx Institute for Marxist Theory and Political Analysis live stream series. Uh, today, we are honored to be talking with our colleague, Dr. Danny Shaw, uh, about capitalism, trauma, addiction, and recovery, what drugs mean for the working class and for revolution. Uh, and we're going to get to all that right after this. <laughs> everybody it is going to be a very uh deep conversation today and i'm really looking forward to it the effect of drugs on working class communities can't be understated especially in our era of the opioid epidemic uh i'm sure almost everyone watching this no matter where you are has been touched by this problem in some way or another uh before we get to that though I want to say just a couple things about uh, what's happening at the Institute right now. Uh, Danny is hosting a, or teaching a class in Marxism school that's kicking off so soon that I am so incredibly excited about. It. I mean, all of us are at the Institute. Uh, but yeah, it's it should be really good. So if you could, Danny, uh, you want to tell us a little bit about your class? Yeah, good afternoon to uh, all the comrades, fellow travelers, and, and friends who are joining us for this important uh, discussion. Uh, next Thursday, next week, we're going to have this uh, eight-week course. Uh, we want to do a deep dive on the Soviet Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, the Sandinistas, uh, different revolutions in the 20th century that we need to uh, study and have a certain mastery over so many uh, anti-imperialist and class concepts. And then also it's dialectical opposite counter revolution and why the US ruling class works all day, every day to overthrow what the Chinese have accomplished, what the Zimbabweans have accomplished, what the Cubans and the Venezuelans and the Bolivians and the Nicaraguans have accomplished. So kicking it off uh, next week, reform a revolution, a Marxist view of revolutions uh, past. As you can see, we have nothing but proletarian prices. And if anyone's even struggling with that $20, you know, we can make it happen. And the goal with whatever funds we raise through this uh, internationalist effort, we want to send a comrade uh, down to Bolivia and Peru with our comrades uh, down there so that they can study uh, Quechua. That was a big part of my early days as an internationalist learning Cuban Spanish and then Dominican Spanish and then Haitian Creole among other languages. So we want to make sure that one of our people uh, has that opportunity to uh, do a deep dive into Quechua um, or Aymara, whatever indigenous language they, they feel would be most useful. And then to bring back that ancestral knowledge here to the belly of the beast and to keep building this anti-imperialist movement. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so important when uh, we live in a country that's been breastfed McCarthyite anti-communism for such a long time. Uh, it's so important to talk about both 
the immense successes of socialist and anti-colonial revolutions of the last 100 plus years, but also the role of counter revolutions, um, which are ever present. They're not just, you know, these spontaneous events that happen here and there, but um, things like constant blockades and the constant hybrid warfare that empire wages on, on countries that have successfully broken out of the chokehold of U.S. imperialism, all of those things are forms of counter-revolutionary violence that uh, shape the existence, the form of being in the world of socialist projects. And I think something happened with uh, Noah's connection, but uh, we're hoping that uh, he'll be back. Uh, you can all sign up for the class now. There's still, I think, uh, around 20 or so spots left. Uh, we're going a little bit bigger than we have with the previous classes. Uh, uh, we're going to have 50 students that are going to be in the class. So sign up all while you can. So part of uh, the discussion that we're going to be having here is is rooted not just in the importance of these topics, but also in a in a very enlightening article that you wrote some years ago that we had a chance to uh, republish. Uh, and it takes its title from a Black Panther slogan, which is capitalism plus drugs equals genocide. Um, maybe we could start there. What do you uh, uh, what do you think of that uh, slogan and. Um, what do you think its its importance in helping us understand the role of drugs in uh, destroying poor working class and oppressed communities in our country? Yeah, for me, uh, coming up in uh, Brockton, Massachusetts, and later on the Bronx, New York, I saw uh, my own family uh, decimated by the opioid epidemic, by crack cocaine, by alcoholism. Um, so from a very young age, I was uh, exposed and overexposed and also seeing all of the violence and the PTSD and the sexual trauma in my family of origin. Um, I always wanted to have a cognitive uh, understanding of this issue. And because I was a basketball player and I got a scholarship in 1996 to play ball at uh, Columbia, later on had a a two decade long boxing career, a lot of people would point at me and say, well, you know, look at Danny, you know, Danny made it. And what they didn't know is I was just a functional uh, addict. I don't care how high your GPA is. I don't care how many <laughs> uh, streams one is doing, how much organizing uh, addiction lurked in the shadows. I'm 45 years of, of age and I, I continue to uh, bob and weave with them ghosts of, of traumas past and, and with addiction. So throughout my ideological journey as a, as a socialist, as an anti-imperialist, I was always trying to understand how is it that in the richest country in the world, uh, the US uh, GDP is around $27 trillion uh, dollars per year. China is set to surpass the United States in another decade or, or, or two in terms of the highest GDP in the world. China is just under uh, $20 trillion right now, hard on the heels of uh, the U.S., which can only uh, make us smile that a multipolar world is not just around the corner. It's actually here and it's here to uh, stay. We're all witnesses to history and hopefully participants. So when I was doing research, in, in learning directly from young lords, uh, mentors, and, and Black Panther mentors, some of whom are still uh, around. Uh, the, the Panthers just, hip hop this weekend just celebrated a 50 year anniversary and the 50 year anniversary of the Panthers was just a few years back. So that's why I wrote that article. I come out of uh, 12 step recovery. And the 10th tradition of 12 step is that we'll never bring in anything that would divide us. So you're not allowed to touch upon any political or religious issue in the three minute shares that we do in my you know, everyday recovery meetings. But I always knew that the Panthers and the Young Patriots and the Brown Berets and what Fred Hampton and the Chicago Panthers and the national leadership called the Rainbow Coalition, the original Rainbow Coalition. So when I looked at how the Panthers and the Young Lords sought to collectivize uh, their approach to this issue, that addiction was not an individual issue. Because what capitalism does is it seeks to atomize us, individualize us, isolate us, and demonize us and say, 
pull yourself up by the bootstraps. You just has to be, you just have to be tough. And they don't talk about generational trauma and historic trauma. And in, in, in the case of the black nation, um, uh, post slavery, uh, post traumatic slavery syndrome is Dr. Joyce uh, Leary has, 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 has called it in her uh, intellectual work. And when I heard the Panthers, they put out this uh, pamphlet in 1968. It actually came out of uh, Michael Tabor, who was a leading New York City Panther and, and part of the Panther 21, along with Afeni Shakur. You know, shout out to Tupac and his mom and his family. We lost Matulu Shakur just a while ago. If anyone hasn't seen Dear Mama, which came out on Hulu, it's an incredible tribute. Five episodes is a tribute. If we talk about generational trauma, which is what made Tupac, we also have to talk about generational resistance, which also made uh, Tupac, who died at such a, you know, 25 years of, of age, and he produced so, so much. So, yeah, the article that I wrote um, 50 years later, the Panthers formulation, capitalism plus dope, still equals uh, genocide. And I think that analysis is more relevant than ever. And of course, the state persecuted uh, the Panthers and did more than persecute them just in 1969, 26 Panther leaders were targeted for execution and were indeed eliminated by COINTELPRO. 26 Panther leaders just in 1969. And they knew that if they could cut off the head of this emerging uh, dragon, they knew that um, the state COINTELPRO, Jehu Edgar is uh, the Panthers called J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, they knew, you know, they knew that they could uh, plunge oppressed communities back into the play. That's what the Panthers and their theor theoretical contributions, that's what they called the drug epidemic that ravaged their communities in, in, in the late 1960s. They called it the plague. And any empirical look at what we're suffering through today, uh, the average now per year is over 100,000 overdose deaths in the United States. I think we could easily double um, that number, because a lot of times uh, deaths are attributed to asthma or other causes, but it's it's the fentanyl, it's the Percocets, it's the heroin, it's, it's, it's the crack, it's the alcoholism. So, yeah, that's what first brought me close to this, uh, this issue. Man, that's, it's wild how uh, the, it seems to be a universal that it's always sort of a situation of poverty, of of uh, being around all of these negative things that, you know, we each have our individual particular story, um, but it all kind of goes the same, right? Like uh, you mentioned being like a functional addict. That was me. You're functional until you're not, <laughs> right? Um, but what I find really interesting is the sort of form that the ruling class attacks us with through drugs. Uh, and you mentioned sort of it, the, the crack epidemic, especially in the 80s. Well, this ties in really well with the international situation. What's going on in the 80s, right? It's counter-revolution against, I mean, and the entirety of South America, really, right? Um, and it's in areas where coca is grown right and this is when crack gets pushed into poor neighborhoods especially targeting black neighborhoods and nowadays you see with the opioid ep epidemic where is the empire on an international level well it's places where opium is grown right it's afghanistan it's iraq etc um and so what i find really um uh, what I take away from that that's positive, I guess, is that it shows us sort of when we peel back the surface that we all, no matter what country we're from, if we're in a working class community, we got that same enemy attacking us. And we got the same sort of road and struggle in front of us. Yeah, 100 percent. When... um when the settlers, the colonizers came to these lands and they created this thing called reservations, no, no different than the Bantu stands as they called them in uh, South Africa under 
apartheid and those Bantu stands on some level still exist in South Africa. You know, the open air prison that is Gaza in, in, in the West Bank today, what the colonizer does, uh, they seek to isolate our communities. So with the indigenous population, they surrounded the reservations with bars, with, with pubs, um, and had that fire water really bleeding, you know, the communities. So to this day, um, when we look at the highest numbers, the communities most plagued by alcoholism and by addiction, it's, it's, it's definitely oppressed communities. So the oppression goes hand in hand with um, addiction. We should all study the 1980s. We should study how the quote unquote intelligence community, the CIA, the DEA, how they targeted uh, the black nation, specifically in South Central Los Angeles. There's that whole series that came out called Snowfall, uh, where, they, where they recreate that uh, time period. Uh, Freeway Ricky Ross is one of the big uh, dealers back then, directly connected to the CIA. And of course, they put Freeway Ricky Ross in jail for 100 years. But how come no Oliver North and Ronald Reagan and no CIA agent ever did a day in prison? They got promotions. And this is not Midwest and Marx conspiracy theory day. This is uh, John Kerry, who, who some of you all might remember. John Kerry oversaw the... Uh, so-called Kerry Commission and oversaw a whole congressional inquiry which proved the culpability of the U.S. government in the trafficking of cocaine into Los Angeles, into the most oppressed communities that we in this country call uh, ghettos, right? And uh, no one to this day has ever been held responsible or, or, or accountable. And then they talk about, you know, chemical warfare in Iraq or in Syria, but the main purveyors of, of chemical warfare and of all types of hybrid warfare is our very own government, the U.S. government, as, as Dr. Martin Luther King uh, pointed out. So everyone should take a, you know, a close look at the 1980s. What happened was the U.S. public had no stomach for another quote unquote Vietnam. I think we should be very specific, like the four agreements say, we should be impeccable with our words. It wasn't a Vietnam war, it was a US war of aggression and genocide against the Vietnamese people. Three million Vietnamese, Laotians and Cambodians are killed from 1962 to 1975, when six million tons of uh, napalm and other chemical agents and bombs and incendiary devices are dropped on the Vietnamese people and the other two nations that I that I mentioned. So the hypocrisy of this government, whether it's Biden or Bush or Clinton or Obama or Trump, and they say, well, we're against the trafficking of human beings and we're against drugs. And it's pure rhetoric when we can add on to Dr. Martin Luther King's statement when he says that it is my government that's the number one purveyor of violence in the world today. We can add on to that and empirically say it's our government that's the number one a trafficker of human beings directly or indirectly. And it's the number one trafficker of the opium, of the cocaine. And for them to claim that they're out here like cowboys chasing the bad guys when they are the number one uh, bad guys. I was just publishing on Haiti and how about 1 million illegal US guns have made their way to Haiti fueling this uh, hybrid gang war in Haiti. And now they're using Kenya. Uh, to spearhead the latest, which will be the fourth uh, U.S.-led invasion and occupation of, of, of Haiti. Well, it's the same thing with, with drugs. Who controls the seas and the ports and the crates and the import, export? And often on CNN or Fox, you know, they'll, they'll have some big police bust to try to make the Miami PD or the New York PD or the DEA look good. But how many times have they looked the other way like the case of the Contras who are waging this war against the Sandinistas and, and just full solidarity to our people in Nicaragua who, who've been fighting um, this U.S. hybrid war, shadow war, non-conventional war since 1979 and, and before that. And I think a lot of people have the wrong stance on Nicaragua because they don't understand what the Nicaraguans, what the Sandinistas, their rank and file and their leadership 
have had to overcome now since the year that I was uh, uh, born. It's it's 45 years plus of hybrid war against the Nicaraguan people, including this use of, of cocaine and crack to raise funds for that illegal covert war. Because the US public said, we don't want another Vietnam. We don't want another Korea. And they couldn't get the vote passed in Congress. So they went to these, these, these covert war tactics. This, I mean, that's the beginning of the proxy, right? Is the contrast, mm -hmm. and and it, I, I mean that you can. There have been countless interviews with sort of the uh, original uh, gang leaders that were selling crack here, right? And all of them, they would ask them, you know, where were you getting the cocaine for this? And every single one would go, oh, some Nicaraguan guys. Right. Who were those Nicaraguan guys? They were the counter revolutionaries organized by our government. And it's so like just right under the surface that all you got to do is ask the question, what's up with this? And then it's all right there for you, you know. And we were talking with uh, a, a week or so ago with Camila Escalante about this. And this is something that I think the vast majority of the American people already like accept like there's no doubt that it was the CIA and the State Department that flooded um, our communities with with drugs in order to divide us. And you point out something in the article, Danny, which is that there's there's no willingness for the ruling class to end this war on uh, the, to end these uh, addictions and, and to end the proliferation of drugs and in, into our communities in part because they're the ones that, as we've been talking about, proliferate them into our communities. And it's a structural necessity of capitalist imperialism. And it goes way back. You mentioned the early settlers. Um, one of the first articles from one of, I mean, one of, no, uh, the most progressive of the early um, American leaders, Thomas Paine, is on the African slavery in America. And he says in the first like two paragraphs how it was that these slave traders were able to divide the African nation. And it was through uh, debauching them with liquors and using liquors as a form of dividing these communities in order to uh, more easily be able to enslave them and pit them uh, against each other. Then, you know, one of the things you mentioned in the article is how this functions as a way to separate people, but it's also... Uh, rooted in a separation that's already part of the everydayness of working class people's lives. It's rooted in capitalist alienation, which forces us to find forms of escape. And, and, and drug is a form of escape that ends up then proliferating that form of separation from, uh, uh, from the community. And, you know, we're, we're dealing with the crowd. You mentioned around 100,000 people dying a year from overdoses, uh, I think the numbers are like there's 68 to 69 of those that are opiate, uh, opium uh, related. And uh, I, I want people to, to realize like the, the extent of collaboration between the government, NGOs, the universities, the private uh, medical, industrial, pharmaceutical uh, companies and insurances, and also private doctors and how you know, all of these parties were involved, and I would recommend this article from Jonathan Markson, uh, Eddie, Eddie's article from the second, journal, the second issue of the Journal of American Social Studies that provides a historical materialist analysis of our uh, horrific healthcare system. Uh, but it says here very clearly in this article that they've even called people uh, opiophobic for uh, questioning, uh, you know, the legitimacy of using these things and... Um, and just how it how it is that uh, they proliferated addiction, and any anyone who presented a criticism of that was called opiophobic. And it was, you know, you see it here. It was uh, health professionals, patient advocacy groups, medical professional societies, research universities, teaching hospitals, public health agencies, pub uh, policymakers, and legislators, along with opioid uh, companies that proliferated it. Uh, and so, who, what interest is this government? that functions only for the, the big monopoly capital is going to have and actually destroying this, uh, uh, these drugs, these, these forms of poison and genocide that are destroying our communities. None, because they're the main ones that are 
proliferating it because it benefits them. It's been an old strategy of divide and conquer. And you divide the people according to a plethora of different ways. It's not just one. You divide them with racism and different forms of bigotry or um, you divide them by, you know, creating middle classes that end up identifying with uh, the established order and, and, not, and less with their uh, folks that have, in terms of material existence, a lot more similarities. You divide them through drugs, you divide them through a whole host of things, but it's all aimed at dividing the people, factionalizing the masses so that they can't come together and fight against the system that divides them and that keeps them all in different forms, immiserated, oppressed, and alienated. You know, you you mentioned the very early forms of this sort of social control right through through drug use and things like that and that continues all throughout american history i think though it really really kicks off in the 1950s with the experiments the cia was doing on the american people for social control right and how to prevent what they saw correctly i think as a growing revolutionary movement which sort of culminates in the civil rights revolution, right? But uh, I'm, I'm talking about like MK Ultra and everything attached to this. And what we've seen since then is just the further sophistication of the machine that gets started then. And what was the goal then? Because it's the same goal now. If we have a working class and poor population that is desperate, hooked on drugs, et cetera. It cannot organize proper resistance against its exploiter. It just can't. Um, I, I know there's a lot of sort of more anarchistic theories revolving around organizing drug users, but really the issue isn't organizing drug users, but to, how do we help drug users get healthy so that if they are interested in joining us in the class struggle, they can do so effectively rather than being a slave to this substance. Because I know personally that that's all you are in the end. And it's one of the saddest, most disgusting, like self-loathing feelings you could ever have. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. You know, uh, I know I'm rambling a little bit. I just think it's important to understand what it does on an individual level as well. Yeah, so in response to so much that uh, both comrades have raised, um, Danilo Blandon, that's a name that uh, the audience can Google. Danilo Blandon was one of the leading contras. Um, so they set up these different uh, reactionary Nicaraguans with all the visas and passports and they could traffic the drugs one way and the guns, the semi-automatic weapons down to the Contras. So Danilo Blandon was one of the main uh, Contra leaders that we can identify internationally. And people should look into uh, Gary Webb. There's the whole movie that came out called Kill the Messenger. Gary Webb was a journalist. I would say left-leaning, but by no means a, a Marxist or anything. And Gary Webb started to see this mysterious new drug in the streets of L.A. and throughout California, crack cocaine. And he started doing all the research and, and realized this whole Contra crack cocaine connection to the ghettos in, 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 in South Central. <clears throat> and um, Gary Webb was very mysteriously found with two bullets in, in his head. Um, and then they claimed that it was a suicide, but how would a journalist of this caliber commit suicide and shoot himself twice is, 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 is clearly a mysterious question. So there was some type of foul play. People should check out Gary Webb's journalism with the San Jose Mercury News. Yeah, shout out to Camila in Calcetun News down in Bolivia, nothing but respect for the amazing anti-imperialist work that they, they do. I spent some time uh, down in Ecuador and Peru and, 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 and the coca leaf is something that, that has amazing you know, healing qualities, <clears throat> but it's been misused <clears throat> and, and commodified into what we know as um, cocaine. And <clears throat> we talked about the liquor, uh, the liquor wars, if you will, 
I, I've been in certain U.S. neo colonies where the liquor in, in, in the alcoholism in in the program we always say it's alcoholism. It's not alcohol was ism. It's alcoholism, and it's had a devastating effect on so many uh, oppressed communities. I mean, I remember just seeing the complete zombification of um, oppressed communities in Haiti and in, in the South Bronx and in Cape Verde. So there's no question that that's a way to divide and control us. We have to study the opium wars that the British empire waged against the Indian people, against the Chinese people, against so many people who have sought to be self-determining for uh, uh, so, so long. And of course, you know, for me, as a survivor, as an addict, I think for so many of us, I also have uh, a certain working class chauvinism, a certain, you know, pride because we really, we came from nothing. We weren't supposed to make it. A lot of my siblings and cousins and neighbors on May 1st, I lost my best friend from growing up in, in Brockton, Massachusetts, 45 years of age. And, and my boy, Chris, he's he's gone, you know, it was the fateful dose probably had some some fentanyl in it and we've lost you know so many um anonymous uh, uh survivors <clears throat> and it's so important to unpack the different layers of alienation social alienation alienation in the workplace alienation the, the division of our uh, uh being from the products that we produce because we don't own any of it someone else gets so rich off of our surplus labor off of our blood sweat in, in, in tears. And <clears throat> when we lose somebody, we often cry individual tears and we blame ourselves and we, we, we blame the parents and, you know, the, the American ethos, the capitalist ethos is the Protestant work ethic and pull yourself up by the bootstraps. And what the Panthers and Young Lords were able to do, they were able to offer a clear social explanation of why Malcolm X as well. You know, I start that article off with a quote from Malcolm X and Malcolm X says, wine, heroin, cocaine, we're, 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 we're killing ourselves and they're killing us um, directly. So for a long time, the leadership of the black liberation struggle and the Puerto Rican independence struggle have understood that this is chemical warfare being waged against our community. So. We should all have a certain pride that we've, we've made it and we, we, we've, we've hopefully turned on it. And what the Panthers were saying are that um, an, an, an addict, you know, is, is our son, is our brother, is our daughter, is our sister. We have to be there for them and we can't heal individually. And that's the importance of these 12 step programs that, that I come out of, that so many of us come out of, you know, any time of the day. I can just go into my phone, I can call 100 to 200 addicts um, with telephone therapy and just reach out, I'm triggered. You know, I'm having a halt moment because addicts often relapse during halt moments, halt, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Um, and the Panthers were able to collectivize and bring together all these wounded souls, all these traumatized people and tell them, kind of like the Goodwill Hunting movie, which is from when I was growing up, when um, uh, Matt Damon was was younger. But that clip with Robin Williams, you know, it's a bit cheesy as Hollywood, but y'all can indulge me for a few minutes if you haven't seen Goodwill Hunting. But Robin Williams is like the, uh, the social worker, older brother, and he just hugs Matt Damon and tells him over and over and over, it's not your fault, it's not your fault, it's not your fault. And if there's anyone struggling with addiction in your in your family close to you, you know, give them that 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 big hug and tell them just that, because all of the research shows that we don't become addicts for the hell of it. We become addicts because of the childhood trauma, because of the abandonment, the rejection, the neglect, the abuse, the PTSD, the, the sexual violence, the physical violence, the emotional violence. We're robbed of a self-esteem. In recovery, we always say, yes, we're egomaniacs, but we're egomaniacs with an inferiority complex. And I don't think that the U.S. ruling class, for all the reasons that Noah and Carlos have enumerated, they have no interest in having a scientific Marxist understanding of addiction because they want us to continue to fall by the wayside. Uh, many members of the proletariat are, are now redundant from the perspective of capital because if they can super exploit workers in Indonesia, 
or in Vietnam or in Haiti or in Honduras, they don't have a need for us in South Chicago. They don't have a need for us in Philadelphia or in Hunts Point and Williamsburg. Why are they going to pay a black worker or a poor white worker or, or a Puerto Rican worker 17 an hour in a factory here in the U.S. if they can produce those Nikes or that or that or that Victoria's Secret, whatever product for a pittance in an exploited uh, neo neo colony? So what the Young Lords and the Panthers did was if they caught a hustler, a dealer in their community, the first time they confiscated the drugs and they were very um, as understanding as possible and said, look, it's a new day on 116th Street. It's a new day in, in Watts. And, and they destroyed the drugs. The second time they called over the whole you know, community and pointed out that this was an enemy of the people who'd been caught selling drugs the second time, made sure the whole community could see the coke or the heroin dumped into the sewerage. And then the third time, and this is just what I was, what I grew up on from the, the OGs, the, the Panthers and the young lords who made it. And they told us these stories in the movement in the Bronx and in Harlem in the 90s and in the early 2000s. The third time they would take the dealer up to the you know 20th floor, hang them by their their ankles over and said, you know, the fourth time we got to let you go. It's nothing personal, but you're putting poison into our community and it's killing our people. So, you know, the dealers got three or four chances before um, they, they, they let go. And good point there by, by somebody. Yeah, Huey P. Newton was killed by this uh, chemical warfare after they waged psych psychological warfare and trauma against him in the prison system. Huey P. Newton was ultimately uh, killed in the streets with a, a cocaine deal, you know, gone bad. And we can say that Huey did this, Huey did that. Huey was the ultimate survivor of this uh, chemical warfare. So that's the model I think that we need to emulate the Fred Hampton model, the Mark Clark model, the mayor of the ghetto, Bunchy Carter model, the, the Young Lords model, um, where they were the mayors of the ghetto, where they were there shoulder to shoulder. And of course, they suffered from these very issues because if machismo exists in our community, you can expect that it's going to exist in any revolutionary organization. And if 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 drug use and abuse and escapism, you know, that's what we always say is addicts with professional escape artists. And my middle name is is denial because that's 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 the process, you know. So as revolutionaries, we almost have parallel battles. We have the revolutionary battle, but there's the revolution within the revolution. If I can't stay sober, if I can't stay serene, what serenity, what inner peace can I put out there? into the class struggle, into the into the anti-imperialist struggle. So that's super, you know, personal for me because there were many years I was down and out and I couldn't make those uh, contributions. So the concept of working class chauvinism or working class pride, it comes from Alfred Lumbrano. He was a uh, Italian American kid who somehow like myself snuck in to one of these imposter fake plastic Ivy League institutions which really only exists for the networking of, of rich people, by the way, if you don't really want to know what the true function of Harvard, Columbia, Brown, Dartmouth, and these other uh, shadowy institutions are, is nothing more or less than the networking of the bourgeoisie so they can maintain their sororities and fraternities and all of their power links. 90% of Ivy League students don't receive a penny in tuition. So you know what social milieu, what social classes they come from. Us 10% who snuck in and get the scholarships, you know, they just do that so the liberals and the New York Times can then say, well, look, you know, he came from nothing and he made it out of Harvard and now he works for the State Department in Nicaragua. Oh, the Nicaraguans kicked out the State Department because they're smart. But if Xiomara Castro tried to do that in Honduras, she could be assassinated tomorrow. So, yeah, many people that I went to undergrad and grad school today who, who, who were scholarship students actually work for the State Department and the intelligence cabals. And, and that's how they flip ideologically onto us this whole idea that anyone can make it under this system, which is absolute, you know, bull malarkey. Yeah, you bring up something that really hits home for me, and it's that uh, no, I'm not a 12-step guy. I got clean a different way. And for me, I actually think 
that people need these options, right? Whatever best suits what produced them, they should be offered. And I think that's one of the problems with our current system is we're really only given the 12-step option. But for people that like me, the 12 steps just don't work for it. There's not an alternative a lot of the time. Now a lot, now they're, they're beginning to start these type of things. But what I mean is uh, one of the things that keeps me clean, uh, and I'm 16 years clean now. I was addicted to heroin though for uh, six years. So I'm coming up on three times the amount of time. Anyway. What keeps me clean is a sort of sense uh, that working class pride, first of all, right? That I was able to do something. Uh, and, it, you know, it ain't just me. It's a whole community of people. But um, but it's a sense of duty as well, knowing that I could slip up and then I'm useless to everyone. I'm useless to building a revolution. I'm useless to making this a better place for the people I love. I'm useless to the people I love. And so I think that creating that sort of thing within a community where you can lean on each other in moments of weakness. And I still talk to people that I met in 12 step programs to do this same thing, right? To have that community of other people that know my problems and get it when I call them it, you know, midnight 10 years down the line like hey man let's hang out for a minute you know i'm going through it right now i just need somebody that understands and i think building that up within a revolutionary organization it, it could be a, a very positive thing that we could bring back in our era absolutely oh, go ahead then yeah, um, very, very eloquent. And of course, I agree. You know, I am a 12 step or I'm a 12 step guy, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we shouldn't use yoga on the beach and meditation. And in the program, we always say um, we attack our disease from every angle, you know. So I'm a therapy guy, I'm a silence guy, I'm a retreat, you know, men's retreat type of guy. I, it, no one should ever say, you know, 12 step recovery is the only way that would be ridiculous. Uh, Carlos shared a quote there that I probably haven't read and uh, it's, it's my own quote, but I don't think I've, I, I, yeah, that's an eloquent quote right there. I, 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 I certainly believe it. I haven't heard that in a number of years. So it was a good refresher. That, even that's like, that's like Wayne, uh, Lil Wayne, uh, listening to his old lyrics, he's like, I wrote that? God damn it. <laughs> Probably the first and last time I'll be uh, put in the same sentence as Little Wayne, but I, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, the concept of higher power, HP, I think can be confusing for some people because people think it has a religious undertone. I mean, for me, absolutely not. You know, we say my higher power is G. OD is in this group of drunks that I'm healing with, or this group of derelicts. Um, you know, gift of desperation is another GOD. Like, we often don't get help as addicts because we want to. We get help because life is so miserable and life is so humiliating and rock bottom. You know, that's what we call people might be thrown off. You know, I, I, I'm a, I'm a dialectical materialist. Don't get, just because I use the word God. And for me, G-O-D means a gift of desperation moment that got me help, that got me into therapy. You know, don't be thrown off. Because I've seen people also use the whole, well, I can't embrace any type of higher power. That can become a, a, a self-fulfilling prophecy and an excuse. So I hope that uh, everyone should explore every type of recovery, whether it's Buddhism or, or, or some, some men's group. Um, you know, Noah mentioned uh, heroin and I'm on a, on a case right now. I'm, I'm at work. I've been working with a family. I think today's day 18. Um, several members of the family are trying to kick these, these ghosts, the heroin, the crystal meth. So it's interesting for me to have emerged from this this, this very sad underworld as we're swept under the American carpet, if you will, and to now be in a position to help others 
we call that being of service. Because the moment that I stop being of service and I I get you know just into you know my my own interests and I get selfish, um, you know that's when I'll, I'll relapse. So at any moment of the day, I'm taking a phone call. We're making a phone call. We call it uh, telephone therapy. Going back to the 19. 19- 38, the writing of the, the big book, the Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, blue book by Bill W., Dr. Bob, and that whole crew out of New York City, Akron, Ohio, everywhere uh, in between. And I couldn't agree with you more. Like, if it wasn't for me having revolutionary direction, and this is what the leaders of the Russian Revolution wrote. They wrote that under capitalism, we're going to have one million obstacles challenges, every type of perfidy, every type of being broke, every type of desesperanza or or despair. And what's going to get us through that? And it's going to be this great vision that we call socialism, that we call struggle. So I think in a way as revolutionaries, as class conscious people, we almost have a one up on, on society if we try to get clean, because underneath all of this, we have the light at the end of the tunnel, metaphorically, we know that what can be done can be undone. We know that revolution is inevitable in Haiti, in Guyana, in in every exploited US neo-colony right here in the belly of the beast. So I think that I had kind of a one up, you know, the athleticism certainly helped me in many, we we need, we call it top line behavior. If you're you're going through withdrawal and you're just brooding and, you know, cause, cause, because what does heroin actually do for a person? And I ask that rhetorically for the, I know Noah has has, has his, his answers, but everyone out there, what are opioids, heroin, what does that actually do for you? It's the hug that we never had. Because when heroin hits in that, in that vein, it starts here in the heart. It's an enormous warming of the heart. And then that, that warmth, that warm blanket, it shoots out throughout the body. So if you've been abandoned by your father, if you've been, if there's incest in your family, if you're a survivor of all the insidiousness that goes hand to hand, shoulder to shoulder with capitalism, white supremacy, U.S. exceptionalism and imperialism, if you're a survivor like so many of us, I mean, what percentage of of U.S. capitalist society, if there's 340 million people in this country, officially there's 27 million of us in recovery. Survivors of some type of childhood trauma, I'd put it somewhere at 60, 70% of US society, you know, and all of the statistics show that anywhere from 60 to 98% of hardcore addicts, when I talk about addicts, I'm not talking about you smoke some weed once a week. I'm talking about real addiction, not to take anything away from the struggles of whoever has a beer here, a beer there, a little bit of weed here that we're talking about chronic overuse. And weed can be abused as well. If you need weed to wake up, go to the bathroom, eat and go to sleep, clearly your relationship to marijuana, you know, you might want to look at it. Not, none of my business. I got to clean up my own side of the street, but different things can be can be abused. But I just want people to understand why opioids, why heroin for that first two, three weeks a down and out human being who has not been able to build up self-esteem through no fault of their own, through the fault of this decadent racist society because of the generational trauma they went through and all of the abuse, that heroin hits, forget about it. You know, that warmth you feel. And then the rest of your life is what what uh, this writer who wrote Chasing the Scream um, that's what he, that's why it's chasing the screen because the first few weeks it was like finally I have a respite I have a pause I have a break from so much self hatred from so much internalized strife for the first time I can feel you know a little better but then it becomes an addiction and if you ever talk to anyone who struggled with with heroin it becomes maintenance and then that maintenance period very quickly gets into the vomiting the shakes and I've I've detoxed dozens and dozens of human beings, family members and friends from opioids, from benzos, from alcohol. And as um, Parenti's son or Parenti's cousin, yellow Parenti, I couldn't see the full name, but yeah, you can't put marijuana. Marijuana has medicinal qualities. So we we can't put marijuana in the exact same category. That's correct. You know, uh, I'm going to get personal for a minute here. I think it's also important to touch on 
that it doesn't take an acute trauma to kick off an addiction. It can just be the general trauma of growing up in poverty because that's what it was for me. Um, you know, I grew up on food stamps and never having enough and that follows you. And as, as soon as I was old enough to work, I was working because my mom couldn't, she was sick. She had this massive heart attack and a heart transplant and I needed to help my dad just to pay the rent. Right. And so for me, uh, there was, and everything you're told in our society is that if this happens to you, it's your own damn fault, right? Uh, rather than, you know, we live in a society with a parasitic ruling class that when your mom gets sick, we're going to use that to enrich ourselves rather than just help her, right? And so for me, it was that sort of thing where I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. Just in my head all day, every day, right? Working as hard as I can. I needed a break from that. I needed anything that would let me sort of shut off my brain and focus on something else. Uh, and then that sort of, as it goes on, that turns into something else. And that becomes your new way to hate yourself, right? Um, so these days, I take a lot of pride in having been able to figure out a way out of that and build myself into the sort of man that my son can say he's proud of. Uh, because it, it took not just, you know, the acts of me getting clean, finding a community of people that I could rely on to help me stay that way. Um, it took understanding why I was doing all this shit to myself in the first place, right? Why... I went and looked for drugs in the first place. And it also uh, sort of leads me into how uh, the legal opiates almost always turn into the illegal ones at some point. Like everybody else, I started off thinking it wasn't a big deal, just you know, stealing Vicodin from a, a family member or whatever. Uh, and then it turns into a big deal because your body builds up a tolerance. You need more and more. And I mean, the heroin is basically the exact same thing as Percocet, just a different form. Really, it's a stronger form, of course, but it's the same chemical reaction in your body, in your brain. You have opiate receptors and this sort of clamps onto it. Lastly, I also think that there's a technological aspect we could add to this as well, because medicinally we have options for people now that weren't there. Um, when even you know, when we were younger, uh, there's Suboxone now, right? Which is not the same as getting on methadone. Suboxone is a thing that doesn't get people high and give them that psychological thing they need the way the heroin does. Um, but then you also get the abuse and people who stay on it for 50 years or whatever. I just think that there are a lot of aspects to this. And I don't know. I, I feel like sometimes we focus on the really, uh, really sort of out of the ordinary ones to the detriment of the ordinary you know what i mean uh not to minimize any of the acute sort of uh, uh extraordinary situations which frankly are kind of ordinary too but that everyday life and capitalism creates this huge amalgamation of issues that go into this that's a really good point and someone mentioned in the chat that uh, gave Ramont, i've been reading his book the myth of normal and he calls that the difference between the all pervasive small t trauma and and the big t trauma and we mm -hmm. usually focus on big t trauma to the detriment of small t trauma that still shapes tremendously our behaviors because uh, the way we end up reacting to those traumas become uh like ingrained in us at a very like almost 
instinctual level as a form of adapting to a certain thing that we had to adapt to uh, in that form when it first came up in order to just survive. Um, and when similar situations come up, that instinctual adaptive reaction uh, comes out. Uh, and that's it's all pervasive. It's not just like this massive event, like you mentioned, like just the generalized trauma of being poor or of living, uh, of being part of an oppressed community. And what's interesting, you could take it deeper than that. Uh, Danny had mentioned uh, uh, generational trauma. It's there's studies, there's abundance, an abundance of evidence showing how it can be handed down, how this trauma can be handed down generationally and the connections of it to stress and the connections of stress to chronic illnesses and diseases that for some reason we have just normalized or thought of as, you know, it's just the luck of the draw that you got cancer or it's just in your genes that you got this or you got that. And uh, what Mate and others' uh, work shows that it's, it's rooted in stress that's connected to uh, trauma. And that's we're in a we live in a trauma ridden uh, society. Um, there was something you mentioned, Danny. Uh of heroin functioning like a hug. Um, and that's that's so interesting because, uh, you know, we've we've teased out this topic of, of mental health and the reaction of the medical pharmaceutical industrial complex, which is just focused on, on money and on creating conditions that provide for more treatment because that means more capital accumulation and not actually nipping the things where they should be nipped at because that leads to less medicine and less a profit being needed. And there was a doctor who uh, uploaded a video that Eddie and I were reacting to where he said that he found that a lot of the people that he was dealing with, people with anxiety, some people with drug addiction, some people with depression, severe depression, what helped the most often was not the drugs. Uh, it was the conversations that he was having with them. The fact that they were able to express themselves talk, release some of those things that they were holding inside and felt that someone was there for them. That sense of community, which capitalism radically breaks from all of us and systematically breaks us from our peers, our families, our communities. That's what these people needed. And you don't, you don't, you can't profit a whole lot off of just talking or at least not in the same <laughs> off of medicine. Um, there's a, another point that I just wanted to tease out real quick. You mentioned a revolution within the revolution. And this is so important because, you know, you get these this liberal tendency of, say, you know, climate change and reducing it. So we just have to reduce, reuse, recycle. That's the bullshit I heard growing up in, in school. And then, like, the leftist reaction is, no, it's the system. And, uh, and, and there's a tendency, like, when we encounter a very individualistic, a way to approach a systemic problem to then go to the opposite and ignore the individual factor. And you could, you do the opposite of this. You, you focus on this dialectically and you look at the interconnection of both the individual and the collective. And, you know, you don't undermine the revolution. Uh, it, uh, you don't, you, you uphold both the necessity of the collective revolution and of the internal revolution. And this is deeply rooted in you know, in an actual, an actual Marxist analysis of social transformation and in things that we have been trying to tease out at the Institute, you know, it's got an article coming out, Walk the Walk, which is about the sort of ethical transformations that we can undergo to become better communists, better human beings, the sort of people that, that uh, our class can look up to and, and, and trust in the process of struggling for socialism. In the uh, Now in the Marxism and the History of Western Philosophy class, we've been discussing some Aristotle and the possibility of like a communist virtue ethic, touching on Lenin, on Che, on Marx and Engels and on others. And uh, it's important to realize that like, when we transform ourselves, uh, we're also transforming our community because the individual is nothing but the ensemble of social relations that they exist in. We can't transform ourselves without at the same time transforming our peers. And our peers, when they transform at the same time, they transform us. And so those ethical transformations are so important. And I just want to bring up Karen Exile's comment here, which is really good. We can't just run from bad habits. We need some good thing to run towards, something worth fighting for. The, uh, Danny, you mentioned sports. Um, it's, it's, it's a process of replacing the older bad habits with good habits. And this is deeply rooted, not just like in our Marxist analysis, but 
it goes all the way back to, to ancient Greek philosophy, like the ethical life for Aristotle was the one that was ingrained in healthy habits and, and virtuous habits. And, you know, it was a ethics was not a matter of like knowing, having the correct, perfect idea and the correct, perfect ethical maxims, but embodying in your practice and in your habits, the things that embody virtue and that make you turn towards the good. And um, that higher power um, comment that you bring up in the article and that you talked about a little bit, it's so important because it's having that cause, that thing that you're fighting for, which allows you to simultaneously create the habits that will force you to, uh, that, that are necessary in order to move towards that goal, that higher power. And there's none that's more beautiful. There's none that's more emancipatory. That's, there's none that's more human than that struggle for socialism, that struggle for universal human emancipation. Um, and, and, you know, I think no one embodies it. Like he mentioned that uh, the way that, you know, part of the reason why he can keep off of it is because he thinks about, well, if, if I go back into it, what am I doing for my struggle? What am I doing for my class and, and for my brothers and sisters around the world that need us to fight here and overthrow imperialism so that we can all be free? But I've been rambling enough. Sorry about that. No, that's extremely eloquent. And I think that's the uh, multi-layered dialectical analysis that we have to bring to all social phenomena whether we want to understand the rise of vaping, the rise of school shootings. Um, Pornhub put out a study that they got something like one trillion hits in 2022, you know, twice as many hits as there are, or three times as many hits as there are human beings. Uh, pornography is a plague. What does that teach us about you know, uh, uh, human relations and sexual relations, right? Everything's become commodified and mass produced and exploitative. Um, how can we take this analysis where we as individuals are the ensemble of, of the social conditions around us and apply it to these random school shootings? Uh, that's the type of analysis that we have to continue to produce in the spirit of the Panthers and when Bobby Seale in Chicago, you know, alongside Fred Hampton, when he was getting out of prison and Bobby Seale talked about what is self-determination, the ability to define phenomena for ourselves, for our communities. That's, that is what power, you know, really is. And right now the powerlessness, um, the social alienation, that's why we're always looking for, looking for escapes. And, um, for me, you know, as Angela Davis said, the personal is political. I came from a family uh, devastated by all of these issues. So my childhood, what I went through and survived and what I always have to be careful because my siblings and my family and my children and my parents, you know, they don't necessarily want me, <laughs> you know, putting anything uh, from, from the family uh, out there. So I try to speak in the most generalized terms um, possible, but people ask me when I became, you know, my students or mentees or whoever will ask me, well, how did you become a revolutionary? And I say the first time that my mother was humiliated, the first time my mother was abused, the first time my mother was, 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 was hit when there was violence done unto her, that's when I became a revolutionary because I can't stand for bullying. I can't stand for bullying against the Venezuelan people. I can't stand for bullying against any group of human beings or any individual. You know, that's all we are as revolutionaries. We're, we're, we're people who don't believe in bullying. We don't believe in humiliation. We don't believe in exploitation. Filiberto Heda Rios, Puerto Rican revolutionary who was ambushed and assassinated by the FBI in 2006 in Puerto Rico, que vivo Puerto Rico libre. You know, we believe in an independent, self-determining Puerto Rico. Filiberto um, talked about he defended Puerto Rico's independence, not because he was the bravest individual in the world, but because he had common sense and he had common dignity and he had common patriotism, you know, real pride in his nation, not this white supremacist, uh, narrow nationalism and white nationalism that a, a Trump-like figure uh, puts out there. I think it's important to make the connections to the legal form versus the illegal forms of these drugs. You know, Adderall is legal, but Adderall is just the pill form of crystal meth. And a lot of Adderall addicts will ultimately need 
crystal meth. The clearest example being so many of us, construction workers and architects and, 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 and um, how you say construcción de paisaje, landscaping, like we had this or that injury, this magical pill that the Sackler family from Greenwich, Connecticut put out there, right? And they got fined something like $6 billion, but did any of those rich people ever do a day in jail? Of course not. But we saw that six that. billion actually hurt them. No, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But that's yeah, it's disgusting. It's painful. We sell a dime back. We try to make twenty bucks in the street. We go right to Rikers Island. We go right upstate to Attica. We go to Sing Sing. But these people pushed and trafficked billions and billions of dollars worth of pills. Never, never did a. Um, and there you go, dog, dog eater. You know, is, is talking about their own personal. Uh, testimony. So my worldview uh, came out of everything that my mother went through. My father wasn't um, around. And what I saw in my family and in so many families were these themes of uh, sexual violence in our childhood. I had different basketball coaches who were inappropriate with us. I've published on them. Jim Tavares was, was, was one of them. Um, Jack McMahon was another. I wanted to put the names out there because a lot of the men I grew up around would always say, like, I'll kill any child molester, and they would be all manly. But the child molesters right in front of us, the teachers, the, the basketball coaches, the Boy Scout dudes, the, 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 the Catholic church officials, you know, they never did. They never did shit. So I call them out on their hypocrisy. And in the basketball world, those guys never did shit because their kids got the starting positions. And their kids, you know, I, I played ball against Kobe Bryant in 1995. I played ball against Allen Iverson. So the Junior Olympic, the AAU, this big time basketball has its hierarchy. And these fathers could have cared less. They talked all their shit. And, and, and these basketball coaches were doing so much damage and they never intervened. So I want to put them on, on blast as well. The insurance system, I was trying to change therapists a year ago. I made 31 phone calls to my insurance just before I could get through to somebody. And then I started calling all these different therapists. Oh, I don't take that insurance. And I was like, well, I just got it from the insurance. This healthcare system is so broken and so insidious that an everyday addict like myself, basically what they're doing is they're ignoring you, then slapping, in your, slapping you in your face and humiliating you when you make all them phone calls. By the end of them phone calls, you're like, shit, I might as well relapse because they don't give a fuck about me. And that's what we're saying. We have to care about one another because this society doesn't care about us and they're going to continue to bully us. So how do we hold one another down? How do we recreate in our own creative ways? Because it's not 1969, it's 2023. The objective conditions in society have changed, but the Panthers and the Young Lords and the Cuban Revolution and the Sandinistas and the Zapatistas, there's so many different revolutionary uh, models. You know, Ho Chi Minh talked about when we can um, open up the, the prisons and break the prison bars, and when all the addicts and and, and and are free, the true dragon, you know, will will, will be out. So I think we have to come back to that uh, to that formulation, and that's the general thesis that when our people are not zombified, when our people are not incarcerated, when our people are not so beaten down, that's when the real dragon will 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 surge forth from the the slums, from the alleyways, from the back alleys, from the callejones. And, 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 and that's when, when we'll see true human uh, emancipation and liberation, the spirit of the Vietnamese people and their leadership, uh, Ho Chi Minh being one example. That's so eloquently put, brother. I think this is a really good uh, point to sort of transition to what we can do now. Um. It, and any, I just want to say anyone watching this who is struggling or knows somebody struggling with this, and I think we all at least know somebody struggling, there are a lot of existing programs that you can reach out to. Some of them do really good work. Um, but I also think we should be thinking of creating a community of revolutionaries who understand not just the addiction because we've been through it ourselves, but the sort of way we can think about it using Marxism um, 
and be there for each other within to cause a revolution within the revolution in this. I think setting up some sort of infrastructure, like a real organization on this, is a really, really good idea. If I could, I mean, if I could be in that field, if I could, you know, make my income like that, helping people get over addiction, because I know how important it is to have people who've been there who fucking get it, I would do it in a heartbeat, right? Um, but as it is, it ain't nobody offering that to me. So we build it ourselves, right? Uh, and I think even talking about it like this is a good first step towards that. Right. Yeah. And I, oh, go, ahead, go ahead, Carlos. Well, I, I resonated a lot with what you just said of, uh, you know, having to go through 30 calls. And um, my uh, my mom's a social worker. And sometimes just to get on the line with someone, she's got to be on the phone for five hours just to, to figure out, just to ask a question about insurance. It's going to take maybe four or five minutes to answer. And it's just, it's it's so ridiculous. And I do think that you know, these are these are the people that have been hit the hardest by by this sick and 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 not very sane, not sane at all order that normalizes trauma and alienation and exploitation and that depends on it in order to exist in the form that it exists in. And you know, people if, if there's a way that, like you said, Noah, to to organize in a form that gives uh, people struggling with this, an alternative that's not just like uh, the the regular avenues, but the avenues that help them with the immediate recovery, but also help them understand like the roots of where these things are coming from and help them fight against that with their brothers and sisters that have overcame uh, those demons, that poison that was in, uh, uh, thrust upon them. That'll be so important. And I can't imagine a situation where like a lot of the people that help in the limited sort of band-aid type treatments that are provided today uh, i can't imagine a situation where they wouldn't be interested in something like that just like at least from my experience in college from like the friends that i had that were social workers a lot of them were you know in the socialist club that that we were leading a lot of them saw the evils of, of capitalism up front and they realized the limitations of the very things that they were doing and this is something that i have the experience of with my mom as a social worker as well and um, there's just so many potential avenues for for solidarity, and I feel like often what's what's really missing is 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 sometimes resources. Like these these imperialists have all the resources in the world, and um, you know it's it's difficult, but it's not impossible. And they throw us to the wolves. I'm sorry, I don't want to step on you. I'm going to be brief, Danny. Um, I ask Carlos, I'm a master of uh, saying I'm going to be brief while interrupting them rambling for 10 minutes. But um, this will be brief. So what I really want to, what this made me think of is how often people go to like the self-help guru for this and how these sort of right-wing ideologues have cashed in on this alienation in our class, preying on these people, preying on young men and women who, you know, feel alienated and not like they're made to feel like they're not good enough, right? Uh, we were recently looking at this video of Andrew Tate, who's one of the people who does this, right? Who tells people to work out, get better at being them and blah, blah, blah. Um, he decided he wanted to help this young popular internet streamer uh and you know i think it was all for his own popularity but the minute this kid relapsed into drugs he gave up on it right and so i think a lot of that what this makes me think of is that you need people who actually understand the problem to be the people helping those with the problem this andrew tate guy doesn't even understand drug addiction Yet he's trying to help this kid get clean. He doesn't understand how society functions, yet he gives his commentary on society. Why? Because he has the money to buy a microphone, right? And this dovetails into what Carlos was saying on 
the lack of funding. But I think, I think that if we can build something like the community here within the Midwestern Marx Institute, we can get the funding to create something like this um, and help each other. Yeah, yeah. So much there. And thanks for your revolutionary enthusiasm. As y'all spoke, I remembered Fred Hampton in 1969, and he had all the leaders of the gangs out there at 6 a.m. doing push-ups, giving up all the harmful substances that we were putting in our bodies. And that's why the FBI had to target the 21-year-olds, you know, Chairman Fred and all the Chairman Freds uh, across this country. I think we have to definitely go back, you know, to our to our people. The answer always lies with the with the people. I really like what our future homestead was was saying there. You know, the Panthers had the survival programs with the tuberculosis trucks and they were doing everything uh, that Lincoln Hospital was not doing in the Bronx. And yeah, the clinics that, that, that we need to start. I think there's a, a, a an incredible amount of potential because as revolutionaries, we have all of our skills that we've picked up um, careers and, and skills. So um, many years back, I was sitting in a 12 step meeting on 37th street and I had drugs in my pocket. And at this point I wasn't even trying to consume them. I was trying to sell them, but I went to the meeting, thank goodness. And I just broke down and I just asked for help. I just said, I need help. I need help because in this society, they're never going to reward us for being who we truly are. Making money in this society has nothing to do with being talented, you know? So I had so much bitterness. And as we know, you know, resentment is the number one offender. So I had drugs in my pocket. I'm trying to make money. Thank God I went to a meeting and I just broke down and I just said, I need help. I need help. I can't keep doing this. This is weighing on me and I don't want to do this. But when you're broke and, and, and bitter and you don't know what to do and thank goodness over time I got help. And I got this um, new job. I'm what's called a sober companion, a sober coach, a life coach. I'm on a job right now. I'm actually in, give you all a little tour. You know, poor kid from Brockton, Massachusetts. This hotel room is $10,000 for the week. Um, I work for nothing but um, billionaires and oligarchs so that they can get clean where I'm at right now, overseeing the entire, well, not the entire, but that's the Atlantic Ocean over there. I know there's a, a slight, you know, brilliance uh, on on the screen, but um, it's only because I got clean that I could ever even get a job like this. Um, so I just wanted to to show, you know, anything is 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 possible when we get sober and in serene. I used to hear those stories in early recovery and want to throw my big book at the you know the qualifier at the people. <laughs> But as, as Victor the Van says, how nice, but how nice, how nice for who? For the 0.01%. That's how it's, you know. And, and I, I only tell you the cost of the hotel room to show you how for the people, they have nothing. The billionaires, I mean, this is the 10,000 hotel suite for the sober companion. You know, they're up in the penthouse. You can imagine how much they're paying. But I, I do believe that we have to pool our knowledge and our resources you know, if, if I am an interventionist and I have all this experience with rehabs and getting people clean, why can't I do this voluntarily the way the Panthers did? Why can't we set up our own people's clinics? One concrete example, um, all of Noah's experience and Carlos's experience. And if we put out a call, you know, we could set up our own big brother, big sister, you know, socialist. Well, it's going to sound kind of Orwellian, 1984, socialist, big brother. But we'll work on the terminology. <laughs> but the idea of a revolutionary big brother so we can mentor, you know, our people in Milwaukee and Chicago and the Bronx. And, you know, that's that's what we need. How did we become revolutionaries? Because we had good leadership. We had good um, mentorship. So I'm, I'm all about that. You know, there's no reason we can't voluntarily help one another. Um, you know, if I can help a billionaire to kick, um, you know, 20 Percocets per day, if I can help a billionaire get off of uh, all the Xanax and Klonopin, uh, why can't we do this for our own people voluntarily? What we set up um, about a decade or so ago was something called People's Vigils, because all of the morning, all of El Luto, all of our mourning and burying our, our sons and daughters and sisters and brothers from opioid overdoses 
it was happening in such an individual way. And we asked in the Bronx and across New York City and in Long Island, how can we collectivize these tears? Because when we lose one of us, it impacts all of us. You know, how many of these hundred thousand plus um, U.S. people, I was going to say Americans, but Peruvians are Americans and Cubans are Americans and Haitians are Americans. So U.S. people, Estadounidenses, <laughs> people in, in the U.S., how many future artists and astronauts and revolutionaries did we have to bury? And how many are buried alive in Rikers Island and in other, other prisons? So I think the sky is the, the limit with the culturally informed therapy. We should study the almighty Latin king and queen nation, known more popularly as, as the Latin kings, because in the 1990s, they became more conscious and more revolutionary. And with the leadership of uh, uh, King Tone, Antonio Fernandez, who... We, we, we can interview too, you know, some of these conscious quote unquote gang leaders who have turned it around and said, why are we pointing out our guns on one another? We need to point our guns against, you know, you know who, just like the fraggers. There was this thing in the invasion of Vietnam fragging where the grunts, the everyday soldiers who came from Appalachian, came from Brooklyn and came from the South, turned their guns around on the generals and on the the colonels. And, and that's what we need to do again. So people's vigils, people's clinics, getting to the, the root causes. Yeah, the insurance system, it's all automation. You don't even hear a real human voice. Then they have these token programs. I mean, some of the whack ass programs that I went to, I just went for the Metro car. I just went because the getting on the subway was $2.75. I got the Metro card, sat through half an hour of bullshit, got a free soda, and I was out on my way. I mean, it was tokenism to the 10th degree. It was painful. It was so underfunded. It was like a social worker all by herself making $32,000 a year, you know, talking to like nine of us knuckleheads. And we knew we never had a chance. It was just another hustle. And, and that's how we're going to heal our communities with, with 500 year hemorrhaging traumatic wounds that we have. So the sense of, of purpose that we have in front of us is, is immense. It can even be overwhelming, but we can only do it, you know, like the Zapatistas say, for us, nothing, for everyone, everything. So hopefully people out there who are listening, we can begin to brainstorm. You know, I'll go anywhere at any time, anywhere in this country to build with anybody if we can overcome, um, you know, this, this, this chemical plague, this opioid epidemic and all these different epidemics. And I think there's a lot of people who have a similar sentiment. So, you know, let's get it popping. That's Thank you so much, brother. Uh, I just wanted to address real quick some of the messages uh, here, Dog Eater. We talked a little bit about it earlier. I spent a year in jail uh, for my addiction as a 16-year-old. Yeah, that's a topic that we haven't been able to get into uh, too thoroughly yet. We're about an hour and a half in, but we hope to do another one of these at some point as well. But it's so interconnected to U.S. imperialism, as we touched on early in the conversation, and to the military industrial complex, um, which uh, has a bunch of people working on, on, on pennies on the dollar uh, in there as well and, and producing a hell of a lot of surplus for, for big monopolists. And, I mean, uh, just thank really you, Sam, quick, for, yeah, yeah. before you move on, just on a theoretical level, the interconnection of the different enterprises within finance capital, right? The same firms own the drug companies, the companies that make shit that they sell you in commissary when you're locked up, that profit off of prison slave labor. Like these are all the same and they're all making the same investments and own the same things in their portfolios. It's all a system like, like make you poor, make you get addicted to drugs, get you busted, et cetera. Like it's all a circle where all of it, all of it hurts us just to extract wealth from us. That's it. That's mm -hmm. what it is. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Car well, I do mean to interrupt, but. Yeah. No, that was a beautiful uh, interruption. I think you, you put it. And that's, uh, that's so important. And that's integral to the Marxist outlook, not separating things from each other, seeing everything in its interconnection and its movement and whatever contradictions might exist within them or between them and seeing everything from the lens of the totality, the system that uh, we're living in. And uh, that requires, especially with the issue of drugs, to to look at things from a global angle. One of the 
things that I really appreciated about the speech that uh, Gustavo Petro gave um, to the UN, I think when he it was a, maybe a month or so after he had just gotten elected, um, was that he connected the um, the issue of drugs and addiction uh, to imperialism. And he said, you know, the, uh, the effects that we feel here, um, they're felt also by poor working class, specifically black and brown communities in the U.S. You know, they're felt all over the world. Um, and and that's, that, uh, that point of view that gets at the commonality of our struggles is so, so incredibly important. Uh, um, but yeah, da- Danny, do you have something to say? Yeah, for sure. Um, and, 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 you know, shout out to Carlos and Noah for that amazing, you know, book, the, the, the purity fetish and these necessary critiques of the Western left because everything is interconnected. Everything is dialectical. A revolutionary can have many, many, many uh, contradictions. You know, they, you know how we, we we're familiar with like being a workaholic, which is another escape. There were times when, frankly, I had no business trying to be a revolutionary because my own house, in my own corner, in my own family, were not were not in order. <laughs> so how could I put out inner peace to the revolutionary galaxy when I had no inner peace and I was. Uh, uh, caught up in all this, these different contradictions and, um, and, and, and really the addiction, the antithesis of, of inner peace. So, you know, me at, me at 45 is a different mindset than me at, me at 25, but that's the beauty of, of revolution. Revolution is redemption and we can recognize our mistakes. We can make amends to the people we've lied to and, and hurt. Uh, Paulo Freire, the Brazilian, educator has a great quote where he talks about, you know, you're not a junkie, you're not a tecato, you're not a druggie, you're not a bum. Just the words that capitalism uses. How do you call uh, an unhoused person a bum? How do you call a woman un cuero, una puta, uh, 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 this word and that word? I mean, y'all get the point. I don't have to say the words out loud. I said two in Spanish. But the way we degrade one one another and even degrade our, our ourselves, right? And what Paulo Freire was saying was, no, you're not a wino, you're not a good for nothing. Um, you're oppressed, and by recognizing the oppression that you're fighting against, you can be liberated. So how do we set up these circles of conscientisation? Of, of, of conscious raising, how do we become addicts? And just when you get 10 addicts in a circle, having that type of conversation, you know, beautiful things are, are, are going to happen. Um, the 12 step world allows for it on, on, on some level, but often the 12 step world has more of a kind of salvation army, you know, approach and kind of that liberal approach of saving one person at a time. How can we inject? How can we infuse a more Panther-esque anti-imperialist uh, view to, 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 to everything? And it just makes me go back to Ho Chi Minh about, uh, do I think 12-step programs are a cop-out? Well, I'll just finish with the, the Ho Chi Minh idea. Um, you know, that that's when the real dragon will be released. And that's when we can see our, our people Imagine if we we conquered true self-determination in our communities, if we controlled our school system, if we controlled our curriculum. And that's why we have the Midwestern Marx Institute. That's why the comrades formed it. And it's so important because pe- people always hit me up. I want to do a master's degree. I'm trying to do a doctoral degree and I want to do it in Marxism. And I'm like, well, well good luck with that. The United <laughs> States, like Audre Lorde teaches us, you know, they're not going to give us the tools to dismantle the master's house. I mean, unless you're going to Beijing, Havana, or Caracas, uh, Harare in Zimbabwe, you're not going to get a revolutionary people's institute or, or, or university. It's not going to exist. They might give you some liberal progressive program at, at Amherst in Massachusetts, and there's some good stuff there. I'm not saying don't do a master's, but I'm just being you know, painfully clear. We have to do it for ourselves. The, 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 this liberation is not going to be delivered by FedEx from the ruling class. It's, mm. it's up to us to, to, to ultimately conquer it. There were a few questions. Oh, the, the well, 12 step, 12 step recovery saved my life, along with therapy, along with yoga, along with all the different tools. We should have as many tools 
in our healing toolkit is possible. I don't think we should dismiss any tool. You know, as many human beings as there are, there's going to be that many recovery stories. There's no one or two recovery stories that are identical. Uh, you should never uh, disqualify uh, anything, you know. In the program, we say go to six meetings before you decide if it's right or wrong for you. Go where it's warm. You know, there's Al-Anon for the family members of addicts. Addicts. There's adult children of alcoholics and dysfunctional families. There's Codependence Anonymous. There's Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. There's many different approaches. Check out all of those things and then decide for yourself. But if you're you're in a, a Zoom meeting at 1030 at night with 60 other addicts talking about whatever your issue is, maybe your issue is hoarding, maybe your issue is pornography, maybe your issue is honesty. You know, we say 90 percent honesty is 100 percent dishonesty. So there's different approaches. I don't think we have to um, disqualify any approach. Go where it's warm. Otherwise, you're going to be looking for the warmth of heroin. And what we need is the, the warmth of the collective embrace, as Gabor Mate talks about. We, we can't do this individually, you know. But for me, the fact that I can have a bad moment tonight and I can make 100 phone calls and 50 guys are going to pick up or 75 guys are going to pick up and be there for me, that, you know, that helps me. That helps me. But other people have their own approaches. I think that's really well said. And I would say, and I'm not a 12-step guy, right? Uh, 12 steps didn't work for me, but it, just as we don't dismiss a, something outside of our political echo chamber, we engage with it and find out what works, what doesn't do the same thing. If you're trying to recover from addiction, right? Don't dismiss a thing. And I would add to Danny's statement about going to different meetings, there are all types of different 12 step meetings um, and different groups have different atmospheres. Find one and see if it gels with you before you sort of give up on it all together. Cause you went to a meeting and you know, it was just one guy talking and you weren't allowed to talk and it wasn't worth it for you. There are meetings where they have crosstalk, no crosstalk, Everybody shares, one guy shares meetings with, you know, a thousand people, meetings with six people, all sorts of different permutations because it's different things that work uh, for different people. And that includes 12 steps, non-12 steps, a bit of 12 steps, a bit of other stuff. Whatever works for you, do that. Absolutely. And one of the things I really appreciated about your article is that um, you also uh, rescued dialectically some of the rational kernels that are in Narcotics Anonymous and AA, and um, you're able to, to rearticulate those beyond just the limited atmosphere in which they exist and in towards like the role that the same positive elements that are here could play in a revolutionary struggle. Um, so pl please, again, if, if you haven't already, make sure to uh, check out Danny's article. I'm going to repost it now in the chat for everyone <laughs> Read, but I just say with 12-step with recovery, everything y'all are saying is true. I've been in meetings, you know, the old school, the veteran types, 50, they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s. They can be a little old-fashioned. I've heard, you know, comments that I wouldn't uh, approve of from some of the old timers, whether they're sexist comments or culturally insensitive comments. So you got to you gotta find the meetings that are, that are right for you. There's, there's no question. I've bumped into movement people. I've dumped, I've, I've bumped in, of course, it's all anonymous. I've bumped into super famous people that everyone here would know. I've sat next to revolutionaries. And at the end of the meeting, it's like, wait a minute, I, I know you from somewhere. And then we make the connection to this or that, you know, the Chicano liberation movement or whatever the, the example is. So, you know, never dismiss something until you've tried it. I've been to 12 step meetings in Ohio and West Virginia where it was a real Christian vibe and everyone's higher power is Jesus Christ. That's not me. But can I set that aside because I'm in Ohio for work or whatever? And is that going to help me? You know, that that everyone has their own kind of individual uh, approach to to recovery. Uh, one size does, does certainly does not fit all. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dog Eater, for another super chat. 
uh, need a Midwestern Mars collab with Alcatar Bear. We actually uh, talked to him uh, about two years ago about yoga and Marxism and other stuff as well. Even and, longer uh, than two years ago, brother. Oh, my God. It was like three, uh, almost more than three years ago, I think. Time has flown. Uh, and thanks, Sam, for uh, extending uh, the membership. Uh, Sam says, each day I read some theory, but I read more of the big book. Theory has radicalized me. The big book has made me uh, want to be astronomically uh, better than I am. Happy five months. Absolutely. Thank you, brother. Well, and thank you to all the people. I just want to say that to Sam Dixon, like, same with me. In, in the deeper I got into recovery, I was able to fuse revolutionary theory and recovery theory because so much of what we learn in the rooms can also be attributed to society. Like a, room, a saying from the rooms is like, one is too many, a thousand is not enough. And um, if I'm future tripping or if I'm worried about the past, uh, one foot in the past, one foot in the future, I'm shitting on the present. So, so much of the philosophical tenets of AA, of NA, of all these different groups, I found it's, there is there is a big crossover, as Sam is saying, from reading the revolutionary theory and then reading the stuff in the in the big book, though there is some there is some stuff that's old. Fat. I mean, the big book was published in 1938. It's coming up on, you know, soon enough it'll be the hundred year anniversary of 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 the big book. But it is a book that's helped a lot of people. The twelve steps are always about humility, about recognizing our character defects. Just because somebody is a secretary general, just because somebody's a chairperson, just because they're the you know, central committee member for 30 years of this or that organization doesn't mean that they're beyond human uh, defects, you know. The moment that we cease to be self-reflecting, it's a very dangerous thing. And when I looked at my family and did a deep dive, like a lot of the men in my family, they were just straight up, you know, addicts and deadbeat fathers and they never had, you know, we in recovery, we say recovery is a privilege because Many of us fell by the wayside or, or passed on and are six feet deep and never had the opportunity to actually reflect and then turn on the pain and turn on the trauma. And scientifically, that's what it is. We put up all of these defense mechanisms. So if I'm trapped in obsessions and I'm trapped in this, this anger, you know, the, the Irish word, the, the Celtic word for, for anger is grief. Um, all of that anger, it just masks an incredible sadness, an incredible tragedy, an incredible, um, 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 all of this grief. And what's the grief come from? It comes from everything that we've covered, the poverty, the alienation, the humiliation, the bullying. You know, we need to write more on bullying because these eight-year-olds, these 12-year-olds, these are pure. There's nothing more pure than a baby and a child. What ideological imprints, what media imprints are parachuted down on these children that at eight, year, eight years old, they're making fun of other kids because of their sexuality, because of their hair, because of their clothing. I mean, capitalism has even corrupted our children, which should be incorruptible. So, you know, going back to Rosa Luxemburg and her, her formulation, this is not a choice between socialism and capitalism. This is a choice between annihilation and, and socialism or, or, or human barbarism and socialism. Beautifully said, brother. Beautifully said. Thank you so much uh, to the Fine Art Revolution. Please go check out the Fine Art Revolution if you haven't already. Their work is amazing. And uh, there's always, by necessity, going to have to be an aesthetic and artistic component of every revolutionary struggles. And uh, oftentimes, those end up being some of the more memorable and emotional parts of these struggles. Um, who can you know think about the struggles for for socialism in Chile without Victor Hara. It's just uh, absolute, it's it's kind of impossible. And at least myself, I can't uh, really think about the Cuban revolution without the uh, La Nueva Trova and the new series of revolutionary musicians that develop out of that, Sylvia Rodriguez, uh, Pablo Milanes, and you, know, you had some other old heads like Carlos Pueblas and a bunch of others. So art is so incredibly important. So please check out what they're doing. Thank you so much for the $20 super chat. This has been a great discussion. Uh, throughout COVID, I helped manage a homeless shelter. Uh, many clients struggled with drug addiction. However, they were kicked off if caught using on site. And uh, for some reason, this was, uh, and for some, this was a death sentence, of course. Um, 
Anything you guys want to reply to? I just want to say that not uh, we have to remember that all art forms in revolutionary art are worthwhile. And one of the things that comes to my mind is uh, the the poem about Lenin by mm. uh, uh, but, uh, oh God, I'm blanking. Lays and Hughes. Yes. Yeah. Um, or uh, you know, the speaking of Lenin, that famous painting of Lenin where he's going like this. Um, I'm like terrible with names today. I can't remember the the painter's name now. He's a famous today? painter. Anyway. I'm sorry. Just today. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, make fun of the guy with a medical memory issue. That's really mature, Carla. <laughs> I'm just messing with you, brother. But um, well, this has been a, a fascinating, a very enlightening uh, conversation, and I've I've enjoyed it very much. We got to do another one of these, and thank you so much, brother Danny, for for coming on and and, and talking with us. Um, would you mind um, telling us again about your course, uh, Reform or Revolution: A Marxist uh, Vision, I believe, of revolutions past. A Marxist view of revolutions past. There we go. And I was able to pull it up. Yeah, so uh, next Thursday, we'll be starting an eight-week uh, course. I'll be sharing my uh, experiences, my ideological experience, and also my experience living in Cuba, spending a lot of time in living in Nicaragua, spending a lot of time in, in Venezuela, a close you know, up, up, up close and personal view of these different revolutionary processes, but starting back with the Soviet revolution and, and the Chinese revolution. And then we think we're gonna do a, a part two as is, is, is well. So uh, sign up, it's, you know, it's proletarian prices as always with Midwestern Marx Institute. Um, let your people know, you know, the more the, the merrier. And, and, and just to close on this topic, which is a super personal, you know, topic for me, I love the, the creative brainstorming that we're doing. I know hundreds of um, women and men in the rooms, we call it the rooms in, in 12-step recovery, who would 100% be willing to volunteer their time to go anywhere to, to, to make these connections, um, to try to help get people clean, ultimately with the vision of... Uh, of using our collective energy to unmask, expose, and ultimately break down and overcome and overthrow this system which profits off of the zombification of our people, of, of the most uh, oppressed. And, you know, for me, I grew up so angry. And I really, th thanks to my mom, I did, and, and, and then Workers' World Party and the Party for Socialism and Liberation and the CPUSA and, and, and all these different organizations, I was able to see why I was so angry. There's nothing wrong with the anger. The question is, what do you do with that anger? Are you taking that anger and injecting it into your veins until this vein collapses and you got to move up to your neck? Are, are you are you going out into the streets and fighting? You know, that, that's how I was. I was a street fighter because I was just so angry and I was so messed up. I was just going to the streets in so much pain. And and who fights who? Who abuses who? We're not going after the landlords. We're not going after Mayor Bloomberg or Giuliani or de Blasio or whatever the lackey's name is uh, uh, now, um, the mayor of New York City. You know, we're, we're, we're punishing ourselves. So and all of the other and each other. And that's what cutting is. And that's what anorexia and bulimia and overweight, oh, 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 uh, overweight uh, anonymous, overeaters anonymous, like check out all these programs, check out all this literature. Of course, we're overeating. Of course, we're. Where we're popping pills. We're survivors. And in the words of Bertolt Brett, the German playwright and poet and anti-Nazi, our very survival in this society is a miracle. And, and the only reason that I came out the way I came out as a revolutionary, as a survivor, is because of all of, all of, all of the family trauma and collective trauma and social trauma and historical trauma and generational trauma that I was subjected to. Um, it, it's, it's what informed me. And if I hadn't turned against this system, I would have turned against myself because that's what drugs did. They turned me against myself. They turned me against the people uh, I, I love the most. So that's why we framed it in this way, because if we don't have an understanding of capitalism, how can we have an understanding of the trauma? It's the trauma that leads to this PTSD. It's the trauma that leads to this 
this uh, this acting out, this this need for, uh, for 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 drugs, right? And then it's on us for the individual recovery and for the collective recovery. And if we do enough of that, we can arrive at the antithesis of capitalism, which is revolution and liberation. And then the synthesis will be a new human socialist society. Beautifully said, brother. I couldn't put it uh, any better myself. Uh, Noah, anything you, you'd like to plug before we, we get going here? Uh, I just want to say real quick, because Danny, I, he said it all, right? Uh, that if anyone is struggling, get a hold of me and we will help. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we just finished our, our first uh, Marxism class uh, with Noah. Is there something you'd like to say uh, in summary about how that uh, went? You had a closing class with... Uh, we also had a quick question from someone to... Yeah, to our, our last class was private, so I apologize to anyone watching, but it was just us. Um, and it was amazing. It was one of the most uh, rewarding experiences of my life, helping people. Like when you begin to see people, like, like when it just begins to click, like, Oh, that's it. That's how we understand fucking everything. It's, it's, there's nothing like it. And, uh, it's an honor to be able to help people, uh, get there. You know, I would be nowhere if, if people hadn't helped me. So, uh, I also want to say that we'll be publishing uh, some of the, the entire class wrote papers in different styles, whatever they wanted to do. Um, and we'll be publishing uh, anyone who wants them published on the website. Um, there's a brilliant academic paper. One person wrote a short play. Another wrote a, an incredibly moving poem. It was just mm. fantastic. And all of it was about where they were with Marxism, where they are now, and what Marxism means to them in the world. And I, I just, I can't wait for people to see those because I was, I got choked up listening to the one poem for a minute there, for real. It was that good. So yeah, uh, it's been an honor. Thank you all so much uh, for for being so easy to to teach absolutely that's something i find in my class too and i've talked to danny about it it's uh you know in the university sometimes you get a few gems people that are genuinely interested in in learning and uh sometimes like the whole purpose for going to the class uh is is really because at least those people you know are going to appreciate it there's a lot of people that that don't and you try to get them to do it as best as possible and you know sometimes there's there's uh you can't do it at least in that class but uh it's like having a class full of like those five students uh where in university they're just like boom 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 trying to talk to you after class ask questions so um we go i i try to keep my class down below two hours that i always fuck up and, and go all up to three because there's so many insightful questions and so many topics to break down and we just peel all the layers back and not let any, anything uh, go un, unexamined or underexamined. But um, Future Homestead had a question. This is something I've been meaning to, to ask you, Danny. But uh, are the assignments a requirement for your class that people want to know? Uh, we'll discuss that on the first class. I just want to make it participatory and democratic. If people want to grade, if people... My thing with this whole university system in the U.S. under capitalism is so stale. You work so hard and you write a seven to ten page final paper. And where does that paper go? It disappears and collects dust. I, if we're going to produce any scholarship, let's produce articles that we can put out there on Counterpunch at, at MMI, uh, uh, you know, Code Pink, wh whoever the comrades are, they can... Let's produce something that's actually tangible and we can translate it for the Brazilian comrades and whatever, you, you know, the sky's the limit. Just like this ocean behind me, I just wanted to end with the imagery like, you know, this ocean has really saved me on many occasions when I was down and out and I couldn't kick this addiction thing. I could retreat into this ocean, you know, put my phone far away and just try to retreat into myself. So I just wanted to symbolically, you know, poetically end with that 
that roar of the, the ocean, which I'm super privileged to be working in front of this week. So I wanted to kind of share the, the many benefits of recovery in a, in a collective way. You know, and, and if we have benefits from recovery, you know, in, in an individual way under capitalism, imagine the benefits of a collective revolution for all of us, where ultimately the social conditions and the, the historical trauma that have made it necessary for us to survive by resorting to heroin or alcohol or whatever addiction, as those conditions dissipate and wither away because of our activism and our organizing, ultimately we will see addiction wither away as well. Mm -hmm. in, in the sense that we today understand addiction, as we do away with the exploitation and the miseducation and the systematic segregation and white supremacy uh, and, and, and the xenophobia, and, and all that which divides us, we're going to see it's only we ourselves that can overcome uh, all of the pandemics that exist under under capitalism. So capitalism is the disease. Addiction is merely a symptom. And the ultimate solution is 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 revolution. That's beautifully said. And you have uh, you have books by I, I know specifically one Gerondist uh, thinker during the French Revolution that had a little bit more of a utopian socialist bent. And the idea was once you get rid of poverty and these sort of social stratification that produce all of these evils that produce sicknesses, you get rid of that thing which emerges out of sickness, which is a certain form of medicine. And they were developing, you know, in our, uh, the idea was that uh, if we do our job correctly, we would even be able to abolish medicine because we'll create such a a healthy society that even medicine wouldn't be. And that's just the complete antithesis of everything we have with uh, with capitalist me medicine, that instead of this sort of self-abolitional tendency towards destroying the conditions that make medicine necessary, it's a self-proliferational tendency. Like, let's make more and more and more because that's where profit is at. And it's uh, guided not by health and the Hippocratic oath for regardless of you know, the pledge that they make to it, but to the bottom line in capitalist society, which is profit and capital accumulation. But all right, uh, brothers and sisters, thank you to all who watched. Thank you, Danny, for coming on. And thank you, Noah, for being here as well and, and for sharing uh, all of you, your stories, uh, your deeply personal stories that are, are, are quite moving and, you know, which I, I think a whole lot of people are going to end up finding uh, resemblances in. But uh, we'll go out uh, the same way we came in with the glorious international.